I'm Larry Walther. This is PrinciplesofAccounting.com, Chapter 15. In this module, we will look at special reporting situations, special disclosures that are appropriate. The accounting profession uses an all-inclusive approach to measuring income. In other words, virtually all transactions and events, other than shareholder-related transactions, are channeled through the income statement. We don't decide that a loss can be charged or credited directly to retained earnings, for example. It needs to be reflected in the income statement. In certain situations, though, the accounting rules have evolved such that special disclosures are appropriate for events that are other than just kind of central ongoing or mainstream operations. So we're going to look at error corrections, discontinued operations, other comprehensive income, as well as changes in accounting methods. Let's start with corrections of errors. These are mathematical mistakes, incorrect reportings, oversights, omissions, mistakes, errors. Once an error is discovered in our reported financial statements, it must be corrected. Catch-ups are not permitted. In other words, if we fail to record depreciation in 20X4, we can't go, oops, let's just double count in 20X5 when we're back on track. Both years would be wrong in that case. In the truest sense of the word, we should go back and correct the financial statements of the prior period. Corrections of errors are handled by prior period adjustments. That is, the prior period financial statements are subjected to restatement to make them correct. Now, there is a global exception for adjustments that may be impractical to determine. Let's think about this in a journal entry context. A correcting journal entry would affect retained earnings because revenue and expense accounts from earlier periods were wrong and had already been closed. So to record depreciation for 20X4 during 20X5, We'll need to credit the balance sheet account that's affected, in this case accumulated depreciation, but the offsetting debit will be to retained earnings since last year's income was already closed out. We're not going to go back and reopen the books, then record the expense. We'll simply charge the effect to retained earnings. The credit to accumulated depreciation provides a catch-up adjustment to where the account would have been had the depreciation been correctly recorded in the prior year. Now, if we show comparative financial statements, however, we need to go back and change those. In other words, if we have income statements for X5 and X4, we need to go back and change the amount and show the correct amount of expense for each year. So what we do in the ledger may not be the same as what we're showing in the financial statements. If an error related to periods prior to those for which comparative data are presented, then we would adjust the earliest retained earnings presented. So here's an example. I'm assuming we're only showing a single period's financial statements, 20X5. So here I'm going to show retained earnings at January 1, 20X5, as was previously reported, last year's ending, including the error. Then I'm going to take less the effect of the correction of the error to come up with my adjusted or corrected beginning retained earnings number. This would be the presentation that would apply to the earliest retained earnings statement presented, and it reflects all effects of errors prior to the date of that earliest financial statement. But again, if I showed comparative income statements, I'd want both of those to be the correct depreciation amounts. Let's move on to the subject of discontinued operations. A company may decide to exit a unit of operation by sale or disposal. But disposals of a complete business component have unique reporting rules. A business component has operations that are clearly distinguishable operationally and for reporting purposes. It's what I'm showing here in this income statement is we have a discontinued operation, bailout corporation, completely disposed of a business component during the year. And after income from continuing operations, I'm showing the loss from the operation of this sports equipment business, as well as a loss on disposal to come up with the loss from discontinued operations net of taxes at $470,000. Once I've entered into the phase of accounting for an operation as discontinued, none of the sales or cost of sales or other expenses in the income from continuing operations amounts include anything related to that segment. Everything's been pulled down into discontinued operations. The company disposes of a facility or some other set of assets that is not a business component, then discontinued operations reporting is not involved or invoked. Yeah, I'm talking about selling off something less than a complete business component. For example, Saleout sold its facility in Georgia but continued to distribute the same products at other locations. That would not constitute a discontinued operation. The income statement might include a gain or loss on the sale of the Georgia location, but that would be included as part of income from continuing operations. It's not a separate discontinued operation. Importantly, with discontinued operations, I noted that we were showing the effects net of taxes. I say income taxes are split between continuing operations and the taxes that relate to discontinued operations. This is referred to as intra or within the same period tax allocation. It's also applicable to other items that are reported below 
continuing operations as well as the prior period adjustment and other certain equity effects are sometimes shown net of their related tax consequence. Moving on to another category, we'll look at other comprehensive income. This may arise from changes such in the fair value of available for sale securities. We, call, we saw this in an earlier chapter nine. We might have certain pension plan adjustments or we might have effects from the translation of financial statements of foreign affiliates. Moving on, changes in accounting methods, changing from one acceptable accounting method to another, such as a change from the FIFO inventory method to the average cost inventory method, is what we're talking about here in the context of changes in accounting methods. Now, changes should only occur for good reason, and we don't want to flip-flop back and forth. Uh, just trying to have a higher net income is not deemed to be a good reason for change. There should be some other substantial explanation for why the company is making the change. And when we make those changes, we make them by retrospective adjustment. Financial statements of prior accounting periods are reworked as if the new principle had been in use all along. This is similar to the treatment for corrections of errors, except almost in semantics. We call error corrections prior period adjustments and changes in accounting methods. We're going to refer to them as retrospective adjustments. When we make a change in accounting method, we need to have full disclosure. Notes in need to indicate why the newly adopted method is preferable. The presentation that we make for the change should illustrate the amounts that were previously presented versus the newly derived amounts with a clear description of the effects of all changes. And further disclosure should show the cumulative effect of what the change would have done in all financial statement periods prior to the earliest period presented. Changes in accounting methods are not to be confused with changes in accounting estimates. Changes in estimates are handled prospectively. We looked at an example of this back in the earlier chapter on property, plant, and equipment. We did not make a retrospective adjustment. We accounted for the changes effects over the current and future periods. If a change in principle cannot be separated from a change in estimate, we deem it to be a change in estimate and we report it as such. Let me close by talking about EBIT and EBITDA. These are not accounting measurements. EBIT is earnings before interest and taxes and EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. These are tools that analysts sometimes use. They're sometimes used in evaluating the viability of a business acquisition transaction. They're not accounting measurements. They're calculations of data based on accounting methods. While they might be useful in certain contexts, one needs to be very careful in their interpretation.